Retro Days. We talk about electronics and home media a lot here at Retro Days, but as prevalent as movies and video games were, board games were arguably even more pervasive, lurking in the closet, toy chest, attic, basement, or playroom of nearly every family. Even if you weren't particularly interested in board games, they had a way of appearing mysteriously, then embedding themselves into your life, relentlessly hanging onto your shirt sleeve, even as game pieces went missing and the boards became creased and cracked. They'd lodge themselves so tightly into your closets that even a titanium crowbar couldn't pry them loose. What follows are some of the most memorable board games that were probably in your childhood toy chest, just waiting for you to crack the lid. Clearly, we have a strong connection with board games, no matter if we played them as a last resort on a rainy day when the electricity went out, or if we set up weekly game nights with friends and family. The games were always waiting patiently, never imposing themselves on us, biding their time until the planets aligned and someone said, hey, I'm kind of in the mood for a game of Monopoly. Unsurprisingly, as popular as it is, Monopoly wasn't the first board game ever invented. That distinction goes to Sinet, played by ancient Egyptians in 3500 BCE. The two-player game can still be played today, though since the original rules aren't known, historians Timothy Kendall and R.C. Bell reconstructed gameplay mechanics based on pieces of text mentioning the game. Another game that looked very much like Checkers was carbon dated to about 3000 BCE in the ancient city of Ur in southern Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. In addition, Backgammon, Mayhem, and the Royal Game of Ur are also on the list of oldest known board games. Our old friend the Industrial Revolution, though, can be thanked for the birth of modern board games, mostly puritanical in nature, starting in the 19th century with examples like A Traveler's Tour Through the United States in 1822, The Mansion of Happiness in 1843, and Milton Bradley's The Checkered Game of Life in 1861. This last one is likely the only familiar game to most viewers, as it remained popular through its evolution, eventually being reimagined in 1960 as the Game of Life. Monopoly certainly wasn't the first board game I owned as a kid, but it stands out as one of the most often played in those early years. Though the game can be traced back as far as 1903, when Lizzie Maggie created what was then called the Landlord's Game. It wasn't published as Monopoly until 1935, though, by Parker Brothers. Along with the name change also came some rule changes, including one about taxation. Interestingly, this went somewhat against the original intent of Maggie, who created the game as an educational tool and to explain the single tax theory of Henry George, according to Wikipedia. I wouldn't be surprised if most of our parents already owned a copy before we were born. It feels like the game has been omnipresent throughout my life, much like chess and checkers. It was also known as the game we never finish, at least in my house. The extended gameplay paired with rambunctious kids didn't exactly create the perfect environment for a game like Monopoly. Even if we liked playing with a little houses and fake money, inevitably interest would wane until the game was abandoned for the Nintendo or the new TGIF lineup of shows. And though we attempted to play it often, I was always the shoe, it was far from my favorite. Before we were old enough to play Monopoly though, my favorite game was easily Candyland. Some boxes even say a child's first game right on it. And to be sure, this is an incredibly simple game for a much younger set, but as a kid there was something thrilling about traversing Candyland and meeting all the fantastical characters along the way. Like Monopoly, Candyland came out long before the versions we were playing as kids. According to museumofplay.org, in the early 1940s, when the dreaded disease polio struck thousands of Americans, Eleanor Abbott, a victim of the disease, sought to invent pastimes for children who were recuperating. Her most successful idea became Candyland, a game many people remember fondly as the first board game they ever played. After sending the idea to Milton Bradley, the game was released in 1949 to the delight of youngsters everywhere. At first glance, Stratego doesn't appear as flashy or appealing as other board games. As a kid in the 80s, for instance, would you rather play Stratego or a frenetic and mindless round of Hungry Hungry Hippos? You'd of course be wrong though to discount Stratego. 
The game is essentially capture the flag, easy enough for younger players to pick up quickly, but with enough strategy to entice older players as well. As a kid, I remember thinking it played like a more entertaining version of chess with elements of battleship due to the hidden nature of the pieces. And one round was never enough. Once the board was out, it stayed set up for hours. Different earlier versions of this game existed in other countries, like the Chinese board game Jungle and a European version from 1910. The version we know today was first created in the Netherlands by a company called Jumbo and released in the United States in 1961 through a licensing deal with Milton Bradley Company. As is the trend with many of these classic games, newer versions are created over the years with different aesthetic changes. Monopoly, for instance, regularly releases new boards based on pop culture. Current estimates place the number of variations close to 7,000, with the largest known collection to consist of 3,500 games, with everything from Alice in Wonderland to Zelda represented. Stratego, though, doesn't boast nearly as many variations, but there are at least a few, including titles like Ultimate Stratego and Electronic Stratego. Of course, board games didn't always mean a game played on a horizontal board by moving pieces from space to space, and back in the 80s, those were always the most exciting. There were so many offerings that had interactive elements and plastic toy add-ons, they sometimes rivaled video games. One of the first of these interactive style games I owned was Connect 4, and boy did I love it! It's described as a vertical game of checkers, though it certainly has elements of tic-tac-toe, and like tic-tac-toe, the first player can always win, assuming they play the right moves. Connect 4's origins date back farther than the contemporary version. It's said that Captain James Cook had played an earlier iteration, one with wooden balls instead of plastic discs, on his voyage to circumnavigate the globe from 1768 to 1771. And while the game is also known by many other names, 4-Up, Plot 4, Find 4, Captain's Mistress, and Gravitrips, to name a few, the version known as Connect 4 was created by Wexler and published by Milton Bradley in 1974. Some other games that strayed from the standard board or introduced interactive elements are Hungry Hungry Hippos, Mouse Trap, Dizzy Dizzy Dinosaur, Fireball Island, and Thin Ice. And there were plenty of others, but this list demonstrates the vast variety of tactile games that often didn't always rely on strategy as much as they did on luck or speed. There was a lot less planning involved to play a quick game of Thin Ice than an extended round of Stratego. And as kids, these flashy games were often the ones we begged for. Unfortunately, they were also often the ones that we got bored with the quickest. Like, how long can placing marbles on a piece of thin tissue actually hold your interest? Serious question! Making things even worse, sometimes these games didn't function as they were supposed to. Take Mousetrap. This was closer to a standard board game, only gameplay necessitated the construction of a Rube Goldberg device, the titular Trap, which consisted of 25 pieces. I don't remember ever actually playing through a full game, and more often than not, we'd try to just set up the trap to see it work, which didn't always happen. Of course, that isn't to say we didn't all enjoy repeatedly slapping hippo tails or dodging marbles as they raced to knock us off our path. Another genre of board games that became pervasive, especially through the 70s and 80s, were licensed games based on television shows or movies. These included, but certainly were not limited to, E.T., the extraterrestrial, Welcome Back, Cotter, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Pizza Power, Happy Days, Knight Rider, Kojak, and the ALF game. It was exceedingly rare for this type of game to be good, banking instead on the property they were based on to do most of the heavy lifting in terms of sales. In fact, checking aggregate review scores on BoardGameGeek.com reveals that not a single game mentioned was able to break 5 out of 10, with most hovering around 3 to 4. The only game of this type that does break 5, not by much, is Clue. Though to be fair, the movie was based on the board game rather than the other way around, and the game itself was based on murder mystery scenarios that musician Anthony Pratt watched in European country mansions as he played piano. Now, left off our sprawling list today, and purposely so, were any games with electronic or media elements because we're holding those back for their own videos. 
as much as we wanted to jam Nightmare and Dark Tower onto today's list, we knew to do them any justice at all, we would have to wait. Still, that left plenty to talk about and even more not discussed, which leads me to my question of the week. What were some of your favorite board games from when you were a kid? I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. And if you enjoy our content, please consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and maybe even activating that ubiquitous notification bell. It really does make a huge difference. Let's meet again next week to celebrate yesteryear right here on Retro Days. Clicky, clicky.